Good morning. Once again, we'd like to invite you to this Sabbath School lesson review. This is lesson 12, Church Organization and Unity. Before we begin, we'd like to have a word of prayer together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us this morning once again to learn of your word. We thank you for this time that we could study together. May your Holy Spirit help us teach and understand. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We would like to welcome you to this lesson study today. Our main key text is found in Matthew chapter 20 verses 26 and 27. And it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. As Seventh day Adventists, we are Protestant Christians who believe that salvation is through faith alone in what Jesus Christ has accomplished for humanity. As we look at the lesson, this talks about our unity in Christ. And the church is God's family on earth, serving, studying, and worshiping together. Our 27 fundamental beliefs clearly says of a few things that unites our church and the importance of church organization. What kind of unity did Christ have in mind for the visible church today? This is so important a question because as Christ was here on this earth, he taught the people and his Disciples took his teachings and went about teaching to different places, setting up churches at homes and in different places. Number 14 of the fundamental beliefs of Seventh-day Adventist Church states, in part, the church is the community of believers who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It continues, the church is one body with many believers and members, called from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. In Christ, we are a new creation. Distinctions of race, culture, learning, and nationality, and differences between high and low, rich and poor, male and female, must not be divisive among us. Through the revelation of Jesus Christ in the scriptures, we share the same faith and hope and reach out in one witness to all. This unity has its source in the oneness of the triune God who has adopted us as his children. Seventh Adventist Belief, page 201. We would like to focus on four very important aspects or elements in regard to church organization and its unity. Uh, leadership, organization, doctrine, and its mission. Believers recognize Christ as the head of the church. And nevertheless, a degree of human organization is essential for the mission and the unity of the church. We would like to read Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 to 19. It reads, And he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Verse 19, 
For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. What are the key ideas if the relationship between Christ and his church? In this text, we clearly see that Christ is the head of the church, and the church is the body of Christ. The head manages all the parts of the body. As the head, it directs, it guides, it decides, and the body without the head itself is useless. It centralizes everything on the head, and we know that Christ is the head. We as believers, we are the joint in a unity of working together, collaborating together in this headship who is Christ. Jesus gives a structure of what this organization would look like. Christ is the head of the church, and the church is the body of Christ. The very existence of our church dependent on the source of this life, that is Jesus. All our works, our mission, depends on the direction through Jesus. Jesus as the head brings orderliness. As an organization, there needs to be an order. And Christ as the head brings orderliness. The church derives its identity and its foundation from Jesus Christ. We have many different denominations and churches and religions on the earth today. We have our unique identity because we have our foundation from our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus gave its truth and its teachings. As we read again in Ephesians chapter 5, Verses 23 to 27, Paul gives an example of the structure through the marriage metaphor. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 23. Let us read from 22 onwards. Wives, submit to your own husbands as the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or anything, but that she should be holy and without blemish. It gives us the relationship between a husband and a wife. As the husband is to love the wives, as Christ also loves the church and gave himself for her, for this very church, we ought to love Jesus as our husband, the church as the bride 
and as the wives, needs to consider Jesus as our husband, our head, head of the family. The church is to be subject to the head Christ, and is subject to his authority. The church is built on Jesus Christ, and that's a sure foundation. Our acknowledgement of Christ as the head of the church helps us to know whom our ultimate allegiance must belong, and that is none other than Jesus himself. Many a times, we pay our allegiance to different things. But here it is clearly mentioned that our allegiance must be to God and to God alone. The church needs to be organized well, but this organization should always be a subordinate to the authority of Jesus, the true leader of our church. Yes. Definitely we need an organization, a structure. We need to have a well-organized church and a structure. Yet, the importance is this organization, this church, should be a subordinate to the authority of Jesus, the head and the leader of this church. There are elements that helps us understand the qualities or the kind of church leaders and that is none other than the leadership that is shown by Jesus himself as a servant leader. It says here in our lesson, during Jesus' entire ministry with his disciples, Jesus repeatedly experienced moments when he probably felt exasperated by the envy for power they seemed to have. The apostles appeared to be anxious to become powerful leaders of Jesus' kingdom. Mark 9 verses 33 and 34, Luke 9 46. Even as the disciples were eating the Last Supper together, this feeling of domination and supremacy were palpably felt among them. The leaders in the church serves, serve others. Instead of seeking their own benefit, they don't pursue their own glory, but the best for each member in the church. It is sad to see that today, as like the disciples of Jesus, they were anxious to become powerful, to become the head. And they were looking for supremacy, which is very unfortunate. And that is not the real nature of what a church leader should be. Instead, a church leader should foster and focus on the unity through serving humbly being humble and upholding the truth, engaging in redemptive discipline and organizing the church for mission. This should be our prior focus rather than to struggle for power. This would only bring disunity. Servant leadership itself brings unity to the church. If all the church leaders and the members should be able to have this quality of being a servant to serve each other, humbling oneself, then unity in the church will be seen. Yet, this unity comes along the way and there could be many disunity even in our family, even in our organization, even in our church itself. So how can we as a church preserve this unity? 
preserving this unity is important. And today, this unity has crept in into our church, into our organization, into our family. Especially, we are seeing doctrinal disunity amongst us. Common doctrines based in the Bible are essential to keep unity in the church. Paul warned us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5, verse 15, and Titus 1, verse 9. He warned us that in the end time, people will heap up for themselves teachers who will not endure sound doctrine, but will move flock away from the truth. And this we clearly see from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. It reads, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I gave you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Time is coming when people will not put up sound doctrine. And this will bring disunity in the church. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their eyes and their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. False doctrine, false teaching will grip into the church. And this will be the main challenge the church will face prior to the second coming of Christ. And this is indeed one of the signs of the soon return of Jesus, that there will be people within the church, there will be people to bring about this false doctrine coming in the clothing of a wolf. And many, many will be turned aside from the truth. They would bring in what their own desire and these false doctrines and immorality will abound in our days today prior to the coming of Christ. In order to preserve this, we are warned today through the very word of God we are warned with the Paul's writing here in Second Timothy that we must use the word to teach, we must use the word to challenge, and we must use the word to correct our beliefs and our doctrine. As Second Timothy 3 verse 16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction in righteousness. Yet we see today that despite the organization that we have, despite the fundamental beliefs that we have, rules and regulation, we know that not all are the same. We expect this unity amongst our church members. And there are times where the church needs to take certain steps and measures to deal with certain issues that creep in into the church. One of the main issues of church organization is to deal with discipline. How do we deal with discipline? If a church members had gone astray, had gone wrong. How 
do we discipline that church members? How discipline helps to preserve church unity is sometimes a touchy subject and easily may be misunderstood. But from a biblical perspective, church discipline centers on two important areas, preserving purity of doctrine and preserving purity of church life and practice. Discipline is necessary. God loves us. And he says, whoever God loves us, he chastens us. And this chastening is not unto death. But this chastening is to bring us back to the fold. And to bring us unity amongst us. And it is the same with the church. And discipline will preserve purity of doctrine. And it will preserve purity of church life and its practice. Discipline is necessary for the unity and the purity of church. It must be always based on biblical instructions. In Matthew 18 verses 15 to 20 and Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 to 2 as we read let us turn Matthew chapter 18 verses 15 to 20 moreover if your brother sins against you go and tell him his faults between you and him alone if he hears you and you have gained your brother but if you will not hear take him with one of one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established and if he refuses to hear them tell it to the church but if he refuses even to hear the church let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector assuredly i say to you whoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven again i say to you if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask it will be done for them by my father in heaven for where two or three are gathered together in my name I am there in the midst of them. We need to take a redemptive attitude towards the person being disciplined. It is not for the condemnation. It is not for the loss. But this is a redemptive discipline. We need to show love for that individual. That's important because that will help him or her recognize his or her wrongdoing, and with it, the need for repentance. So a redemptive act should bring the person to repentance. Number two, we need to show love for the church as well, because that protects her from the danger of false doctrine or wrong practices. Number three, we need to show love for the world, because that protects her from the danger of false doctrine or wrong practices. Our church needs to defend and we need to maintain our identity, our uniqueness. False doctrine will creep in into the church, but we need to be careful with our own church members and at the right time, we need to talk and bring about this redemptive discipline by showing love, by showing concern, because this will foster in the maintaining of the unity of the church. And as well, we need to show love for Christ because their faithfulness shows his character and safeguards his reputation. Because the church is about the people, not about 
the buildings. We might have a wonderful, well-organized church, but what is important, what makes up the church, is the people, the believers in the church. As we can see in the New Testament, the church sometimes is referred to as the group of believers worshiping together. It could be in a particular area or in a place or at home or at a church, but the church itself is a congregation of believers. And this group of people who belong to a particular denomination or who are called themselves by a particular name given for the beliefs and heritage. For this reason, we have been studying throughout this quarter of how we are to focus on our church unity and what unity in Christ means to us. We centered our unity in Christ alone. And our teachings, our doctrines, our mission are all focused on Jesus himself. Through the revelation of Jesus Christ in the scriptures, we share the same faith, the same hope, and the same mission to reach out to the world around. This unity has its source in the oneness of the triune God who has adopted us as his children. As we look at the kind of leaders we are to have in our church, we are to bring unity amongst this diversity of different people within our church with different ideas, different teachings. Yet we're fortunate to have that our church, World Church Seventh-day Adventist Church, can be united even through this Sabbath school lesson quarterly. This unites us. And we're also fortunate to have our 28 fundamental beliefs that binds us together as one and as well with the teachings of the LNG White. But above all, we have the Holy Scripture that unites us. And this brings us the beauty of a church, of our organization. We know, as we can remember, when this church, Seventh-day Adventist, began, it all began with the Word of God through prayer, invoking the Holy Spirit to take in control. They had this in-depth study of the Word of God. They gathered together, the church forefathers, the pioneers, they prayed in oneness, they studied in oneness, and the Holy Spirit was with them. The Holy Spirit was taking control of this. They make God, they make Jesus, they make the Holy Spirit as a unifying factor. And they went into this study. And as they studied, God directs them, God unites them. And the Word of God uniting them, our church was founded. And our identity was maintained, our foundation was laid because Jesus united them. The Word of God united them. And this happened, this was able to be, ha this was able only because they come in unity, in prayer, and the Holy Spirit working in them. So, Christian unity depends on the grafting of the members into Christ. We need to be grafted into Christ. As the members lay aside of himself, the selfishness is driven away and Christian unity is established, enabling them to accomplish his mission. So today, how important is church unity? This is the question we need to pause and ask. Is the church organization really important? Or do we have to do our own way? 
Why is church organization important? Do we really need to have this church to bring together? Yes, it is important because God has given instruction. Even when they were in the wilderness, they have this church of the wilderness. And God, who is the God of order, has given them instruction to build a sanctuary so that God might dwell amidst his people. And that's the beginning of the church organization. And God dwelt with his people. Likewise, in the church today, church organization is so important. But this should be in the pattern of that heavenly pattern. As God instructed in the wilderness, that heavenly sanctuary where God is to dwell and where his mission is to be carried on is to be founded on the pattern from heaven. And as Moses was instructed, Moses built this sanctuary in the pattern after heaven. And as a result, they carried on the mission to the hidden nation around them. As we can recall back, the people, the hidden people around them, they feared the people of Israel. They know the God of Israel. Wow, what a mission. Even before they could step in, into that hidden nation, land, people had already known about this God of Israel because they were organized. God had organized them. In the early church, we can as well witness how the Holy Spirit united the church, how the Holy Spirit organized this first apostolic church and how they went about going to different places and how this mission was carried on from one place to the other place how the apostles had set up and founded this church from one place to the other place so church organization is important but never to forget that we are to lay its foundation on Christ Jesus alone who is the leader who is the founder and who is its husband unity is essential to the church I read this from our 28 fundamental beliefs under the heading how important is church today unity is essential to the church without it the church will fail to accomplish its sacred mission sacred mission Jesus before he went up he had commissioned us go therefore and make disciples Matthew 28 let us read together this is profound and this commission is given to all believers and Jesus came and spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of age. And this is the command. Not a choice. As we go, and as we keep going and doing, we are to make disciples. The mission that unites us is its discipleship of Christ. 
making discipleship unites the church. Meeting those who don't know Jesus as their personal Savior is possible only as we go and teach them and baptize them and teaching them the truth. And in this way, as we go, take this mission, we as a church, as a family of God, we will grow because as we make more disciples, we will have more family, more members in this church. And we are a united family with one mission, and that is to preach the gospel. It is beautifully stated here in our lesson that Jesus' great commission to his disciples includes four key verbs, as we have just read in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 to 20. Go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. According to the Greek grammar of these verses, the main verb is to make disciples. And the other three verbs indicate how this can be done. Disciples are made when believers go to all nations to preach the gospel, baptize people, and teach them to observe what Jesus said. As the church responds to this commission, God's kingdom is enlarged and more and more people of all nations join the ranks of those who accept Jesus as Savior. The Gospel of Matthew begins with the announcement of the birth of Jesus Christ, God with us, and ends with the promise of Jesus' continued presence with us until his second coming. Christ did not tell his disciples that their work would be easy. We will be persecuted. Our work on this earth as we carry on this mission will never, never be easy. It's going to be a lot of challenges. We will be persecuted. We will be put in prison. We will even be put to death. The disciples gave up their life. They dare to go and die for the love of God because they have this love for Christ. They have already built this servanthood leadership, a leader with a nature of a servant. Sometimes it is confusing to understand how one can be a leader as well how one can be a servant. A leader is to lead, a leader is to command, and a servant is to serve. The master, a servant, is to do the work that no one wants to do it. Yet, Jesus has become and had shown the very best example of a servant leader. He served the people. As we can remember, that Thursday night before Jesus would be crucified, Jesus in that upper room, as they were seated, Jesus stooped down, humbled himself, washed the feet of his disciples. What an example Jesus has set for us. As a church leader, we need today to learn about this leadership that Jesus had set for us. Humbling oneself, serving the needs of the people. This will only bring about unity in the church. If everyone wants to be a leader without this quality of a servant, there will be a disunity. And as we serve each other, we can bring about doing the same mission. 
mission itself begins at the church in our own family. And it starts with serving each other. For this reason, as we serve, it is not going to be easy. The disciples faced a lot of challenges, and that's not easy. All of them gave their life in their mission. Today, we, the remnant church, in these last days, we are given this solemn commission, this solemn mission to take this message and to go and to teach and to baptize. This is the way that we go about making disciples. In conclusion, we would like to once again bring about the importance of a leadership that we ought to have in our church, and that is a servant leadership. We ought to have an organization, and this organization is based on the foundation of Jesus as our leader, as our founder. And we need to have unity in our doctrine, in our beliefs. And finally, we need to have one mission because we have one God, one faith, one hope. God organizes this church. So, a good church organization is essential to the mission of the church and to the unity of believers. Christ is the head of the church, and the church leaders are to follow his examples as to lead the people of God. Unity is preserved through the faithful teachings of the Word of God and by his living in faithfulness to that word. May the Lord richly bless us as we take up this mission that the Lord has given us to go, to teach, and to baptize, but above all, to make disciples. And this is the greatest commission that God has ever given us. We conclude with a quotation. Principles of good leadership apply in all forms of society, including the church. However, the church leader in the church must be more than a leader. He must also be a servant. There is an apparent contradiction between being a leader and being a servant. How can one lead and serve at the same time? Does not the leader occupy a position of honor? Does not he command and expect others to obey him? How then does he occupy the lower position of being a servant or receiving orders and fulfilling them? In order to resolve the paradox, we must look at Jesus. He supremely represented the principle of leadership that serves. His whole life was one of service, and at the same time, he was the greatest leader the world has ever seen. May the Lord bless us as we engage ourselves in this work and with the privilege being a part of this Worldwide Church, Seventh-day Adventist Church, may our basis of unity and foundation be in Christ and Christ alone. And in doing so, the Lord Jesus Christ will come soon. And we have part in making our Lord come soon. Thank you so much. And let us close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for uniting us and for bringing us together to this mission that you have given to us as we go about taking this gospel mission may your spirit unite us together and go with us so that the church as we take this gospel message 
we can penetrate to the world around and that your soon return will be hastened. Thank you, Lord, for um, bringing us together to this mission. We praise all these blessings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.